Now, Umar radiallahu anhu, he has lived 10 years as the Khalifa of the Muslimin. After the great openings, he always protected Medina. It is mentioned that during the last Hajj of Umar in the 23rd year after the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, as narrated by Sa'id ibn Musayyib, that when Umar departed from Mina, one of the stops during Hajj, he stopped at al abtah made a pile of sand, threw his cloak over it, and laid down on it. Then he raised his hands to the skies and said, Oh Allah, I have grown old and weak. He was 63 years old at that time. And the people under my care have been scattered. Everyone's gone out now to the different lands. Take me in death before I commit any act of neglect or heedlessness. Then he went to Medina. One of the things that Umar radiallahu anhu, he also made or rule that he did was that he forbade the prisoners of war from settling in Medina. From fear that these prisoners, that these disbelievers would gather themselves together and would cause harm for the Muslimin. Al-Mughira bin Shu'bah radiallahu anhu had a slave by the name of Fayruz, or known by Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi. He used to be very skillful with his hands. So Al-Mughira bin Shu'bah radiallahu anhu wanted Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi to enter into Medina and to work for him in Medina. Even though Umar didn't want to. Even though Umar, he knew that if I let one, then the rest of the Sahaba or the rest of them are going to come and speak to me about this. After the requesting of Al-Mughira bin Shu'bah radiallahu anhu, he allowed Fayruz, who is later known as Abu Lu'lu'a, he began working in Medina under the yani, permission of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Abu Lu'lu'a al-Majusi was working for Al-Mughira and Al-Mughira was paying him a small amount of money. So Abu Lulu al-Majusi, he comes to Umar radiallahu anhu, the ruler, and he says, talk to your companion, for he's overworking me, and he's only giving me a small wage. So Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, I told him to be obedient to your master. And then Umar, he says, with the intention that I'm going to speak to Al-Mughira, to treat him better, to give him more wages. But he didn't say that to Abu Lulu, he just said, be dutiful to your master, listen to your master, and that's it. Abu Lu'lu'a held a grudge in his heart. And you treat all your companions, and you treat all of the people you know good, and then with me you don't even look at me. So he, he, he put a grudge in his heart towards Umar. And then he started to plot and plan on a say Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Until he welded his own dagger, the two-edged dagger, so Umar radiallahu anhu had spoken to Al-Mughira to treat him better, to give him more wages. But he didn't say that to Abu Lu'lu'a. He just said, be dutiful to your master, listen to your master, and that's it. The matter of Umar radiallahu anhu, the detail or the story of it is narrated by Amr bin Maymun radiallahu anhu, one of the tabi'een. He said, I was standing with no one between me and Umar, but Abdullah ibn Abbas, on the day that he was struck. As Umar, he would come to the prayer, as he would pass through the rows, and the men would be standing, he would make sure that the rows are straight. Because this is a prayer in which we are standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is not befitting that we stand in front of Allah and the rows are not straight. So Umar, he is coming through and he's saying, make sure or make your rows straight. And when we were straight, he would go forward and say the takbir and would begin his recitation. He would recite Surah Yusuf or an nahal or a similar surah in the first rak'ah for Salatul Fajr. So as soon as Umar did the takbir, the Muslimin behind him are doing the takbir. Fayruz Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi, he rushes forward between the lines and he strikes Umar. And he strikes Umar while the people are doing the takbir. 
and he had the wood, a two-edged knife, dagger with him, which he had welded himself, he had made himself. And as he struck Umar, narration say he struck him on his shoulder, then he struck him in the stomach. And then as he began to flee and the Sahaba are looking, the first row, he started to stab everyone that he went past. He stabbed 13 people, seven of them also died. When one of the Muslimin saw him, he threw a cloak over Fayruz Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi. When he realized he was caught, when he realized there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to go, he killed himself like a coward. Umar took the hand of Abdurrahman ibn Awf who was standing behind him and made him go forward to lead the people in prayer. Those who were immediately behind Umar saw what had happened. Those who were in other parts of the mosque did not realize but they missed Umar's voice and they were saying, Subhanallah. They were thinking, why didn't Umar begin the recitation? So Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu, he led them in a brief prayer. Then when they finished, Umar said, Oh ibn Abbas, see who killed me. When he went for a while and he came back and he said, it is the slave of Al-Mughira ibn Shu'bah. He asked the craftsman, he said, yes. He said, may Allah curse him. I told his master to treat him well. Praise be to Allah who has not caused my death to be at the hands of a man who claimed to be a Muslim. Because if it's on the hands of the Muslim, then that Muslim will be facing a great punishment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Umar radiallahu anhu doesn't want that. He was carried to his house and we set off with him. And it was if no calamity had ever struck the people like it before. Umar radiallahu anhu as he is laying down in his house, one of the first things that he asked about was, did they finish the prayer? Did they finish the prayer that they had begun? And they said to him, yes, they had finished the prayer. So Umar, he says that no nation will succeed if they leave the prayer. He was given water, a nabith, which is a, a, a sort of drink that they would make out of dates. When they gave that to him, it came out of his stomach. And then they gave him laban, they gave him milk. It came out of his stomach. And then they said, we knew that there's no coming back. That that was his death. And people came and started praising him. He said, oh, Abdullah bin Umar, see what debts I owe. The total debt was 86,000 dinar or that amount. He said, if the family of Umar can pay it, then pay it off. If not, then go to Bani Adi bin Ka'b, the tribe of Umar. See if they can pay it. If not, then go to Quraysh and see if Quraysh will pay it. If not, then don't go beyond them. And then he said, go to Aisha, the mother of the believers and say, Umar, he sends greetings of peace. And do not say, Amir al-Mu'mineen, for today I am no longer Amir al-Mu'mineen. Ask her and say, Umar, he wishes to be buried next to his two companions, Abu Bakr and Wan Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Abdullah bin Umar, his son, he went to Aisha, gave her salams and requested what Umar had requested to be buried with his two companions, she said, I had wanted it for myself, but I will give it up for Umar. Look at the honor and look at the respect that she had for Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. When he came back, it was said, Abdullah ibn Umar has come. So Umar, he said, lift me up. So a man helped him sit down. He said, what news do you have? He said, that which you want to hear, O Amir al muminin she has given permission. He said, praise be to Allah, Nothing was worrying me more than that, to be buried next to his two companions in this dunya. When I pass away, carry me there and say, Umar ibn al-Khattab is asking permission to enter. If permission is given, then carry me and enter me and bury me there. If not, then take me to the graveyard of the Muslimin. So Umar al-Khattab, he thought that maybe Aisha, she was pressured into it. He said, when you carry me, you're going to bury me, go past the room of Aisha and ask for permission again. If she accepts, then take me in. If not, then continue and take me to the burial of the Muslimin. Umar radiallahu anhu, as his predecessor Abu Bakr, one of the most important things that were on their mind at the time of death or during the agonies of death, knowing that death has come close, 
the concern for the Ummah was always on their mind. So now Umar, he's in front of a dilemma. How are we going to continue? How are we going to make sure that the Khalifa that comes next is also an agreed upon Khalifa for the Muslimin? So Umar radiallahu anhu, he came up with a new way of the selection of the Khalifa. He came up with the council, with the shura. And the shura was placed among six sahaba. Six sahaba in which the Prophet وسلم, had died, had passed away, and he was pleased with them. These six were Uthman ibn Affan, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, Az Zubair ibn Al Awam, and Talha ibn Ubaidillah. If you look at the history of all of them, they were from the first of the believers. And there was another companion that he wanted to mention, but he didn't, which was Sa'id ibn Zayd, which is also one of the ten who were given the glad tidings of Jannah. The companion that was, his dua was accepted. But the reason that he didn't mention Sa'id ibn Zayd was because Sa'id ibn Zayd was from the same tribe as Umar. So he didn't want any yani, uh, people to accuse Umar of bringing in one of his own tribe. So Umar عنه, he chose these six and he gave the decisive decision to one of them but he doesn't have an original vote which was his son Abdullah bin Umar. So if the six agree on one then Abdullah bin Umar has nothing to do. But if there is a tie between the two then Abdullah bin Umar he can give that extra vote. And then he said if there is a tie between two votings then take the vote of Abdurrahman ibn Awf. For verily he is, or he has a strong mind. He is very intelligent. And Abdurrahman ibn Awf and his relationship with Umar during his Khilafah is known. And it was known that no one had the courage to speak with Umar like Abdurrahman ibn Awf. Three days to come out and having chosen a Khalifa. So he said Suhaib is to lead the prayers while the council is making the decision. And Umar, he gave a very lengthy advice to the Khalifa after him, reminding him to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reminding him to make sure that he takes care of the Ummah, making sure that he takes care of the nation of the Muslimin. Abdullah bin Abbas, he describes the final moments of the life in Umar when he said, I entered to see Umar and said, receive the glad tidings of paradise, O Amir al-Mu'mineen. For you became Muslim when the people disbelieved. And you strove in with the Messenger of Allah وسلم, when the people let him down. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, died when he was pleased with you. No one disputed your appointment as Khalif, and you have been. So Umar عنه, said, oh, Abdullah, repeat it again to me. So I repeated it to him, and he said, By Allah, besides whom there is no other God, if I had all the gold and silver in the world, I would pay it to avoid the terror of what comes after death. Always had that fear of being placed in the grave and being asked the questions by the angels. Uthman ibn Affan, he describes the late moment of Umar as he says, I was the last of you to see him. I entered to see him and his head was resting in the lap of his son, Abdullah bin Umar. He said to him, lay me lay my cheek upon the ground. He said, is there any difference between my thigh and the ground? He said, lay my cheek on the ground, may you be reft of your mother. The second or third time, then he crossed his legs and heard him say, woe to me and woe to my mother, if Allah does not forgive me. Then his soul departed. Radiallahu anhu. It was mentioned by Ali and mentioned by Uthman that when Umar was announced that he died, they started to cry. They said, why are you crying? They said, they were crying because every time you would hear Umar, all you would hear is the Prophet he went with Abu Bakr and Umar. He came with Abu Bakr and Umar. He entered with Abu Bakr and Umar. He left with Abu Bakr and Umar. And the name of Abu Bakr and Umar were unanimous with the Prophet True companions of the Prophet Imam al-Dhahabi, he said that Umar radiallahu anhu was on a Wednesday, the 26th or 27th of the Hijjah, 
the 23rd year after the Hijrah and he was 63 years old according to the most correct view. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away at the age of 63, Abu Bakr passed away at the age of 63 and Umar passed away at the age of 63. It was narrated from Abdullah bin Umar that Umar was washed and shrouded and the funeral prayer was offered for him although he was a man. And the reason being is that even the shaheed on the battlefield, if they are wounded and then they live for days or they live for time sufficient enough for them to eat something or they live days after, then they are still washed and prayed upon. But the one who dies instantly on the battlefield is different to the one who dies from their wounds. And the one who prayed upon Umar was the great Sahabi, Suhaib al-Rumi. And the ones that entered and buried Umar radiallahu anhu was Abdullah ibn Umar, Sa'id ibn Zayd and Uthman ibn Affan. They were the ones who entered into the grave of Umar radiallahu anhu and buried him and placed him in the grave next to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and next to Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is buried, his head is to the shoulders of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then Umar is buried down towards the waist, between the waist and the shoulders of Abu Bakr. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she says that when the Nabi sallallahu and Abu Bakr were buried, I would enter into the hujra, into the room. I would enter with my hair uncovered and so forth. She said when they buried Umar, I wouldn't enter my room except with my hair covered. Now when the Nabi sallallahu and Abu Bakr were buried there, there was a curtain placed between them and between the room of Aisha. And then when Umar was buried, a wall was built there. So there was a barrier there in her room, between her and between the, the graves of the Sahaba and the graves of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's why Ali radiallahu anhu, he said that Abu Bakr as Siddiq, the dunya didn't want him and he didn't want the dunya. It lost hope in taking over Abu Bakr. As for Umar, the dunya wanted him. The dunya tried to hold Umar, but Umar didn't want the dunya. And that's why Nabi Wasallam, you understand the hadith of the Prophet Wasallam. He said, it's not poverty that I fear for you. What I fear for you is that the dunya will open its arms for you. It'll give you everything that you want and you'll compete in obtaining the dunya like the people before you competed and it will destroy you like it destroyed them. And this was the end of the time and the era of the great Khalifa Umar ibn al-Khattab in which he established the pillars for the Muslim Ummah after him and for the Khulafa that came after him. And he did his best during his time to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.